Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. This week on the podcast, I'm happy to share just a few of the nearly 20 interviews I recorded earlier this month at the 33rd annual NeurIPS conference. If you've been waiting for the Twimmel pendulum to swing from workflow and deployment back over to AI and ML research, this is your time. We've got some great interviews in store for you over the upcoming weeks. Before we move on, I want to send a huge thanks to our friends at Shell for their support of the podcast and their sponsorship of this NeurIPS series. Shell has been an early adopter of a wide variety of AI technologies to support use cases across retail, trading, new energies, refineries, exploration, and many more, and is doing some really interesting things, but don't take it from me. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella recently noted that what's happening at Shell is pretty amazing. They have a very deliberate strategy of using AI right across their operation from the drilling operations to safety. Last year, the company established the Shell.AI Residency Program, a two-year full-time program which allows data scientists and AI engineers to gain experience working on a variety of AI projects across all Shell businesses. If you're in a position to take advantage of an opportunity like this, I'd encourage you to hit pause now and head over to shell.ai to learn more. Once again, that's shell.ai. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone. I am here in Vancouver at NeurIPS, and I've got the pleasure of being seated with Celeste Kidd. Celeste is an assistant professor of psychology at UC Berkeley. Celeste, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I am super excited to dive into this conversation. You delivered an invited talk here yesterday that has been blowing up the Twitters, and I'm really looking forward to kind of chatting with you about it. Uh, but before we do that, tell us a little bit about your background. You kind of operate in the intersection of psychology and machine learning, and we were talking about you building models and stuff like that. You know, what are you up to? I, I do. Uh, I like pulling a lot of things from a lot of places. Uh, my, my background uh, was actually in investigative reporting, which sounds not that relevant, but I was interested in doing big data type analyses. So um, uh, my, my uh, first Real science was getting together public records and you know looking for looking for corruption. Uh, I started at UC Santa Cruz, uh, and then I also liked computers, so started in CS. Uh, I ended up transferring uh, and changing my degrees to uh, linguistics, and then I, I finished the, the journalism degree. Uh, and while I was doing those, I got very lucky and happened upon science <laughs> via, via some really amazing mentors and professors at USC and fell in love with it and liked that unlike journalism in science, truth is on your side. I was like, when you find the truth, uh, you win much more so than I was experiencing at that time uh, in journalism. I thought mm -hmm. that journalism was going to be like that, but um, uh, we I We hope found, journalism is like that. I think it's becoming more like that, and that's actually an interesting discussion too because that's where it's going is much more machine learning relevant than it used to be. Okay. Uh, when I was d making the decision about whether to continue in journalism or uh, to transition to science, I knew I really loved science, but there was still a part of me that thought that journalism was a kind of higher calling. And mm. um, uh, at that time, I had a bunch of stories that I had composed that I was very proud of, uh, but they contained things that my editors weren't expecting. They weren't that sophisticated. <laughs> I was like, I hadn't taken uh, formally a statistics class, but uh, in that era, if I brought something to my editor and it wasn't a, a, a pie chart or a bar graph, they were confused and asked me to like go back and turn it into a pie chart or a bar graph. And I was like, regression analyses are not, uh, uh, we're not things that uh, editors would even like hear you out on. So um, yeah. I think that's changed a whole lot. Well, uh, data journalism is a whole thing it's now. A thing. It's a thing. In the era in which I was in college, uh, the, the thing that was the version of that was obviously named in the 70s and it was called computer assisted reporting. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, the conventions uh, were... Uh, really, really disappointing. Uh, like pretty much what everybody was doing is uh, there's all these workshops and there's reporters that have had profile sto uh, high profile stories and the promise was we'll, 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 we'll tell you how to do something new and innovative and mm -hmm. almost all of them it was like, what I did is I got some public records for school bus drivers 
and then I got registered sex offenders, cross-reference them, bam, story. Um, mm -hmm. uh, now I got some priests and registered sex offenders, cross-reference them, story. I was like, that was the only thing that yeah. people were really doing. And that and, should be like table stakes of, hey, doing uh, some research, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it, it wasn't, uh, uh, I was having a hard time finding inspiration in that field. And then the, the stories I was producing uh, often got... Uh, the editor wasn't willing <laughs> to, to, to uh, run them uh, as they were, or they, they wanted me to simplify them to the point that I, th I thought it wasn't true anymore, and nobody was paying investigative reporters. Mm. Um, I applied to grad school, also had a job that it was very likely that I could have, I was like lined up, uh, that I was, I was considering, and I, I called my journalism mentors, expecting them to talk me out of going to grad school for science. And uh, every single one of them said, this is a terrible time. Journalism might be dead. Um, can you do something else? Go do it. Yeah. Uh, and in that era, I was like, my, my, my grad school stipend, those are not known for being generous, but the journalism salaries are really abysmal. I was like, my grad yeah. school stipend actually was higher um, oh, than wow. my salary would have wow. been if I'd taken the journalism job. So wow. yeah. I'm and happy to be here in science <laughs> where we can do all sorts of uh, uh more sophisticated analyses than, uh, you know, 2000 era yeah. journalism. Yeah. So tell us about the focus of your lab at Berkeley. Uh, we are very interested in belief formation. We're interested in how people form their beliefs. And we apply that to domains that I think people don't think of usually. They don't use the term belief. It's like they use mm -hmm. terms like uh, knowledge acquisition, uh, things that people think of as you learning and you're done, probably that's not true. So things like words, uh, if you know the word table, you might think, uh, we talk about a kid who knows the word table. If I say mm -hmm. like, hey, show me a table, they can point to it. Uh, they produce the word table in the right instances. Uh, but uh, what is actually true, but you can't observe directly because the, the mind is a black box is uh, you're never done forming your concept of table. With every new table you mm. encounter, uh, your belief about the concept of table changes just a little bit and it updates. If you move to a place where the tables look uh, systematically different, uh, your concept will um, move in that direction too. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we think about uh, what other people might call knowledge in terms of beliefs, and we think of beliefs in terms of being kind of packets of probabilistic expectations. And thinking about this example of table, like how would how do you experimentally validate those kinds of ideas? Oh, that's the that's the fun part. <laughs> like, and that's the part we didn't. I didn't get to do that much. Um, uh, you didn't get to do as much in 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 reporting. Uh, so we do things like uh, we ask people uh, to. Um, we give them a choice. As like we say, uh, here's a concept. For example, pick a political figure. Uh, Donald Trump. Uh, is Donald Trump more like uh, Richard Nixon or more like Elizabeth Warren? Um, and uh, people make a selection. As like we collect these comparisons across a whole set of examples, uh, and based on people's responses, um, uh, we're able to use clustering algorithms in order to. Uh, uh, infer the true number of types of categories that exist in, in the population. That's a good uh, summary. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds like from, from what I've read about some of the work at your lab, you're also, in addition to kind of an experimental type of approach, you're also building models and using machine learning to, um, well, you, you describe, how, what, what's the connection between uh, the model work that you do and the experimental work? Uh, it, it depends on the particular type of project, but in general, uh, we're building computational models that represent formal versions of classic theories from learning science. So we take a lot of inspiration from people like Jean Piaget and Maria Montessori and Lev Vygotsky. Uh, all of them had pretty similar ideas about what the relationship should be between what you currently understand and what you're interested in sampling from next or what you are mm -hmm. most able to learn from next. Uh, all of them said similar things about there being a, a just a right amount of information. I was like, you want to seek out stuff that's a little bit different from what you currently understand, but not so different from what you currently understand that you can't gain any traction. Uh, mm -hmm. Those ideas remained largely untested 
because of the black box problem. Uh, you right. can't directly, you know, open up a kid's head and see see what's in there. Um, so uh, we use models in order to represent a sort of formal version of uh, those kinds of ideas. So like for, for that particular work, I was like, we have a set of research about um, infants and how they sample from the world. Uh, we were interested in testing whether or not infants are generating probabilistic expectations uh, in the, the absence of any specific goal and whether uh, those probabilistic expectations were influencing their decisions about what to look at, whether or not they should continue looking at something or they should cut and run and find something else. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, we uh, created a, a probabilistic model, uh, uh, a Dirichlet multinomial, so pretty pretty standard stuff, um, and then use that to compute uh, the surprisal value for different uh, actions in a in a sequence. Um, uh, I'm not sure if this is. I was like, now I'm taking a moment. So I was like, I don't know if I'm going backwards. Is this understandable? No, no. So the the surprisal value is. Well, I just kind realized of the, I like forgot to tell you what they're looking at. I should like. Oh yeah. So maybe. we can go, we can fill in the context now. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, for these experiments, people have been interested in how infants decide what to look at moment to moment for a long time for a number of reasons. Like one of them is uh, you can't ask infants questions. The only way that you can right. find out what they know is to look at what they're looking at, what they're interested in, and try to make inferences. The most common format of infant experiments is you show them a stimulus A, you show them a stimulus B, and you see if there's a difference in looking <laughs> between those two. Okay. <laughs> uh, and from that, uh, you try to draw very rich inferences about what is in that black box, and as you can imagine, like those are those are one bit experiments. Mm -hmm. That's challenging. You yeah. can't really learn anything from a single experiment. What the people that are great uh, uh, in this this area do, as like people like Liz Belke and uh, Renee Biajon, is they're not really drawing inferences from just just one experiment. They do a whole series of experiments, and they know other things in the background about yeah. um, uh, what infants know. So. I was interested in that method. That was a method that I used with Toby Mintz at, at USC and, and was sort of fascinated that uh, scientists were inferring things like whether or not infants had object concepts. <laughs> I was like, that's a pretty rich kind of representation that you're inferring just on the basis of a kid right. looking longer over here versus <laughs> over here. Um, uh, uh, I was interested in that and uh, wanted to know more about the linking function between uh, expectations and infants' interests, and I had that idea, and then it took a few years before I could figure out how you might be able to get at that. I was watching a kid play whack-a-mole, and mm -hmm. objects pop out in some order, and if you yeah. imagine whack-a-mole, it's like imagine there's like three moles and three holes. Uh, that's a perfect that's a perfect instance in which I can imagine a m way to model what you think is likely in this very limited toy space. Mm, so mm -hmm. uh, you walk up to the whack a machine at the very onset. Um, uh, you haven't observed any data, but uh, if I ask you, like, how often do you think each one pops up, people say, like, they're all equally likely. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, there's your prior. Um, uh, now uh, you put a quarter in the machine, uh, you see one mole pop up. Uh, if I stop you right there and say, like, okay, how likely do you think it is mole A, mole B, mole C, You've only observed one pop up, so it doesn't change your mind very right. much. Uh, but uh, if mole A pops up, you keep popping times, up mole A, and yeah, then yeah, there's like more data. Um, uh, you come to uh, uh, that shifts your your beliefs more. Um, so we're using that setup where this is a domain in which if we just care about the sequence of events, we can actually quantify how predictable or surprising uh, a particular event is, that's that's a way of getting at uh, that linking function question. So we made a, a, a version and the, of... Sorry, the linking function represents what? The linking function represents uh, the relationship between... Expectation uh, and occurrence? Value. Yeah, surprisal value for an event in a sequence okay. and infant's interest. Okay. Uh, and surprisal value is a formal way about trying to start thinking about expectations influencing mm -hmm. infants' beliefs, which is obviously true, but uh, <laughs> people weren't sure exactly what, what that what that relationship right. looked like because nobody ever varies it on a continuum for infants. And when um, you call this a linking function, are you trying to actually define the function or get to, okay, yeah, these are probably correlated or these are not correlated or something like that? We are trying to 
understand how infants guide their search for information in the world. Mm. Uh, I think it's maybe easy to forget this because we have limited attention, but at every moment where you or an infant is looking at one thing, uh, you're necessarily not looking at everything else. Each decision that you make about where you're going to put your attention or where you're going to click or what you're going to listen to or who you're going to talk to, uh, because the world isn't static, comes with a huge opportunity cost. I'm here in this room mm -hmm. talking to you and I'm not uh, at the, the, the right. conference seeing whatever is happening over there. I'm not looking at a poster. Uh, right. So um, the, the linking function that we're interested, we're linking, interested in the linking function because we're interested in understanding uh, given how much richness and how vast all of the information is in the world, how could an infant possibly get started trying to make the decisions about like where they should look mm -hmm. and when they should terminate? Uh, and how could you design a system that can go from possessing as little information as an infant has to eventually having uh, not perfect, but as like a relatively sophisticated network of knowledge, like uh, an adult that's studying machine learning. Mm -hmm. Even calling these decisions suggests a higher level of processing than I might think is the case in a lot of, you know, particularly for infants and whether they're looking at the banana or the picture yeah. or something like that. I don't want to, when I use that word, imply that I mean that they're conscious. I think all okay. of these things are happening automatically. Uh, I use the word decisions. So I was like, you could use the word choice. Uh, me and Ben Hayden have a paper in Neuron uh, that's about how uh, we don't really care what words people use. For <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, well, <laughs> use the word curiosity. Yeah, so and we've people, already thought of that question yeah. and wrote a paper about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> like, we, 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 like I, literally, it's part of our, our research program in the lab to uh, work on, uh, yeah, how people's concepts vary and how when two people use the same word, they're not activating the same concept. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't worry. I don't get in fights over right. the, the word. Uh, human language is... The, the point is they're looking at one thing or another thing, and that's what you're calling a decision. Whether, yeah, well, and also... Whatever the mechanism that... That's, that's correct. And the, the, I'm using the word decision or choice because I think it's very important that if you're going to have a, a smart, intelligent um, selection attentional system, if you want that, you want the same general guiding principles to maybe um, explain where you put your eyes. It's like your saccades, your eye movements. Um, uh, where are you going to look? But then that same system should also guide other ways in which you might sample information from the world. So what mm -hmm. you click, it's like what you're willing to pay for if you're buying movies on some 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 kind of streaming service. So like mm -hmm. the, the there are decisions that are more or less conscious. They happen at different time scales. But if you were to design a smart system, what it should do is seek out information that's valuable. And what it means to be valuable is that it offers something new, but you can integrate it with your existing representation. So mm -hmm. the idea of uh, this infant work is trying to see uh, whether or not probabilistic expectations guide infants looking at all. They've been theorized to do that for a long time. And if they do, what is the relationship between uh, some metric like surprisal and their interest? Mm -hmm. And what we found is that, uh, like many people had suggested that it might be, you get a U-shaped relationship between infant's interest and the surprisal value for an event in a sequence, meaning that uh, infants are most likely to terminate their attention to events that are very low surprisal value. So things that are very expected uh, don't offer you much. You thought that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. You did. It's like you're not learning a lot. Uh, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, if it's too surprising, if it's uh, a high surprisal value, uh, you also terminate your attention. Infants are most interested at um, maintaining their attention when they encounter events in the sequence that are a little bit surprising given what they were expecting, but not overly surprising. And does the overly surprising result, is that counterintuitive to you or surprising at all, or is that expected? I think it is to some people. If you are just coming into these questions and you think like, what should I do? I'm going to design a robot that's going to search for um, places that it should learn in the world. You might think like the most new information is the place that I should start. Uh, I like to use the analogy of like, you're going to pick a a book to read or a movie to watch, if I go for the most new information that I could 
find. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you pick like a book in a language you don't understand on a topic you don't know, <laughs> and you can learn both <laughs> theoretically, um, but really you can't uh, because right. you're missing the base levels of representation Got it. to make sense of it. If you know a lot about the topic, uh, you can probably pick up some of the words uh, from a language you don't understand. If you know the language and you don't know the topic, uh, you can make progress on right. the topic. Uh, but trying to do two things simultaneously, the intuition that Maria Montessori had is you're not going to make a lot of traction. Got it. Uh, you're not, you're not going to get traction there. You're not going to make a lot of progress. Uh, and um, yeah, that that there's something to that. And that's why that uh, French version of Game of Thrones is sitting on my shelf, <laughs> only 10 pages of having been read or attempted. <laughs> uh, uh, do you speak French? Not uh, well not enough, enough to get through that book. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. You don't learn about dire wolves in, you know, university French class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, most people have had the experience of trying to absorb information. They, like, want to go wise at a high level, but it's just, like, hard yeah. to stick on it. Uh, that That's the point of all of this. So yeah. uh, what we're theorizing is that you have built-in attentional mechanisms that are guiding you towards material that won't waste your time. And mm. if you are encountering something that is a little bit below uh, where you're at, it's like if it's overly redundant, it's really hard to stay on task for those things. Uh, if you encounter stuff that's beyond where you're at, that should also be similarly difficult to focus on uh, from the perspective of you're trying to not waste time moment to moment, you should seek out stuff where you're making progress, but it's not, overla it's not too overlapping mm. with what you know. And so the models that you're building is the idea or goal to advance or enhance machine learning by applying these traditional psychological learning models to you know create better machine learning models or more to try to validate concretely the things that you're observing experimentally you know with these models or both or neither yeah so it's it's multiple things uh, our First goal is to just understand how human systems work from a basic science perspective. I'm very interested in understanding how people come to know the things that they know um, and how beliefs that you form early influence the sampling process downstream. I just talked about an instance in which uh, your previous experiences shape the knowledge and the beliefs that you have. Uh, the beliefs that you have influence what you're interested in next, which means that uh, little things that happen early could potentially have really profound downstream effects. So mm -hmm. we're interested in these systems in humans, um, but we're also interested in understanding human belief formation because we're interested in making sure that people can design technologies that interface well with humans. So I was like, if you design a technology um, without respect to uh, what we know about humans form, how humans form beliefs, uh, you run the risks of um, designing something that's pushing people away from access to, to reality. Uh, mm. There's ways in which you might push information to form beliefs that are not right, that don't match the ground truth, one of the things that I talked about in uh, the talk was the relationship between your subjective sense of certainty and your willingness to seek out new information and also encode it. I was <laughs> like, even, even if you're not choosing it, if, if you become very certain, a, a rational agent uh, shouldn't waste time there, right? As like I talked mm -hmm. about that in infants. Uh, the problem is that sometimes people become certain when they shouldn't be. Unjustified certainty is a thing right. too. And um, uh, if people become certain, their curiosity goes way down. I was like, if mm -hmm. we present them information after they're certain, uh, they don't weight it in the same way, they don't attend to it, uh, it counts for a whole lot less. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you're designing a system that delivers information to people, it's really important that you're aware of that. Uh, a lot of platforms make decisions to optimize engagement. It makes sense that you'd push content to people that they appear to want, right, right. Uh, as indicated by you know them reading it or clicking it or whatever. Uh, but it's potentially dangerous if in doing that, you're giving people more confirmatory evidence than mm -hmm. they would encounter right. if they sampled randomly from the world. Uh, our systems were not designed to have information 
presented that optimized our interest. It's like our mm -hmm. systems were designed to forage for information in the world. Mm. So second reason we're interested in this is, is kind of from a cautionary perspective. It's very important that we understand how human belief formation works so that we can design technologies that don't mess it up in ways that are bad for individuals and society. I like it's very bad um, if somebody, uh, you know, logs on to Facebook, not sure of whether or not they should vaccinate their kids and walks away thinking that uh, they should Nobody not. Nobody vaccinates <laughs> their kids, right? Uh, no, they, I, I, as like people, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, people should definitely vaccinate their kids. I will go on record saying that. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, they, they're real. No, I, I was saying if they walked away with the impression that no one vaccinates oh, their kids, <laughs> that would oh, be the bad thing, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. Those are actually, yeah, I, I didn't, there's something that was in the talk and then I had to cut for time. You're referring to an inference about what is true for other people in the population. Uh, and I did have a slide about that, but I actually didn't present it in the talk. Um, uh, we showed that uh, when somebody enters a search pretty neutral, they form beliefs very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. We used the example of uh, searching for activated charcoal. Um, if you search for activated charcoal, um, trying to figure out whether or not that's like a useful thing to use. As like yeah. people start uh, by being equally likely to say like, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. Uh, but in just three clicks of about two to three videos, people are all the way up at like 80, 90% for thinking it's probably a great thing for wellness. Mm. Um, and the slide that I cut, uh, not only are they forming that belief from like, I'm not sure to like, okay, I think this is probably right pretty mm -hmm. quickly. Uh, they're also drawing social inferences about the prevalence of that belief in right. the world, <laughs> given the the overrepresentation of you know pseudoscientific materials on right. uh, all of the streaming platforms, this is this is potentially dangerous because it runs the risk of people becoming certain before they have the chance to encounter disconfirming evidence. That was number two. <laughs> number three, I was like, this is the like way future one. This is like the like we're like not near this yet. The goal. Down, downstream, way downstream in the future, um, if you want to design truly, truly intelligent artificial intelligence, you want to understand how human systems work because we fail sometimes, because sometimes we form strong beliefs that are not justified given reality. I was like, sometimes we make bad decisions. You want to understand what the pitfalls are in human belief formation so that you can design an intelligent system that doesn't doesn't have those. Kind of speaking of AI safety types of research or research directions. Um, uh, what do you mean by AI safety? The, I mean, in a sense, an aspect of what you described, um, if we're heading in a direction where we're building AGI, what are the, how do we build safeguards into the AGI so that we protect ourselves as humans, I guess? I'm not so much thinking of that as I'm thinking of uh, situations in which people don't use the data in the way they really should. So for example, um, it's well documented that doctors, although well-intentioned, have gender and racial biases that prevent them from seeing the evidence. Objectively, black women are much more likely to die giving birth to a child than white women are. The reason for that is because when they report that they are in pain, when they report the same symptoms, they're not taken as seriously right. because of racial biases about black women complaining. We are increasingly looking to AI to make decisions in the medical field. People do that badly. And as we are introducing AI into these processes, we ideally do not want to replicate those bad parts of the way humans make those decisions. So those are the three driving goals for your work. In your talk, you listed uh, or reviewed five conclusions of your work. Would you call those conclusions of the? Uh, I, I would call them lessons. Lessons, yeah. lessons. Uh, walk us through those. Number one lesson uh, is that people are continuously forming probabilistic expectations. Uh, they are constantly monitoring the statistics of their environment and using those statistics to inform what they're looking at, what they're listening to, uh, what they're integrating into their new representations. You don't learn the concept for something and then you're done. Right. We opened with that. That was the right. table example. Right. 
And so what were, you mentioned that you've got graphs supporting all this. What were the graphs that told uh, that, that story? That one is the, the infant work showing that uh, you can use, you can compute surprisal over sequential displays and uh, you get a U-shaped trend between uh, their look away behavior and the surprisal value. Got it, got yep. it, okay. Second point we also covered um, is that certainty diminishes interest. Um, so uh, the, the evidence for that, I just picked one example uh, from a study by, by Shirlene Wade, uh, where we look at people's certainty as they're generating answers to trivia questions. Mm. Uh, and the, the take home message is that when you're very certain that you know the right answer, you're not curious. You don't want that information. Uh, a little bit worse than that is like if we present that information, you're less likely to integrate that. Uh, mm -hmm. Once you're certain, you cut and run, you move on to something else. Uh, and uh, that is problematic because sometimes people are certain when they should not be. Uh, right. So I was like, this is a potential explanation for why people sometimes get stuck with stubborn beliefs that aren't justified in the world. If you're very certain, it's really hard to get people to go back and reconsider. Um, the third thing was that certainty is driven by feedback. Uh, so this work actually is the, the the project. I think we've talked about all of the the main lines of research except for this one. This, this evidence comes from work by Louis Marti uh, in which we try to figure out when you feel very certain where that subjective sense of certainty is coming from. Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is an interesting question. Um, it did not come out the way that we were expecting. It did not come out um, the way that we were expecting at all. Uh, when we first... And what is that? Where, what do we <laughs> even mean? Coming from like within the brain or uh, something else? When you feel... So just like how certain do you feel? Uh, does that influence your behavior? Um, and yeah. is your certainty some reflection of how certain you should be given the strength of the evidence? Uh, there are these uh, rational models that show that how certain you should be given the evidence are good at predicting people's accuracy when they're learning new concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, these these uh, studies were done in which you ask people to learn new concepts by just observing evidence. So I was like, right. you give them, uh, you say you're gonna learn whether or not something is Daxi, and then you give them examples of things that are Daxi or not. Uh, sometimes the concept is something- Whether something is what? Daxi. Daxi. You're making up a new concept Got uh, it. for these experiments. We, we like not okay. worrying about the like complexities <laughs> of the world, and we just like, in the, yeah, uh, experimental psych, just like make up something new that doesn't have any of the confounds or problems Got or messiness it. of real world data. So. Okay. Um, so, so we ask people to, to figure out what's Daxi, and then we give them examples. Uh, and how you learn in these tasks is we just ask you moment to moment to say, like, is this Daxi or is this not? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to show you some shapes, and they vary along some numbers of dimensions. So it's like there's going to be different colors, different sizes, and different, different shapes. Uh, and the concept you're going to try to infer just by guessing. So at the very onset... Is this Daxi yes or no? You can't possibly right. know. Um, so you take a shot and you say like maybe yes. Um, uh, and uh, then you get a second, you get feedback, you get a second example and you keep going. Uh, and what the original studies that use these paradigms showed was that the complexity of the concept made a difference in terms of people's accuracy as you might expect. So mm -hmm. if the concept is simple, if it's something like red, uh, just varies along one dimension, people are pretty good at learning that pretty quickly. Uh, if the concept is something more complex, like it could be something like triangle and red and small or <laughs> so <it's> like big <laughs> and blue and uh, whatever. Um, so I like that those, 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 uh, the more logical operators, the more difficult it was for people to infer the concept uh, and the worse their accuracy uh, in those cases, these um, models were pretty good at predicting people's accuracy uh, and the amount of data that was required before you could figure out what Daxi meant. Hmm. Um, but those same models, <laughs> like we were hoping, uh, would be a good predictor of uh, how certain you feel. Uh, we were expecting that people might be more certain than they should be. They may feel more certain than they should be given the evidence. Um, but uh, instead, what we found is that how certain you feel about whether or not the concept you have in mind being right 
was pretty divorced from the, from the strength of the evidence. Uh, instead, uh, the best predictor of uh, how certain you are was whether or not you're getting stuff right, mm. which is a little disturbing because if you're just saying yes or no, it's pretty easy just by chance to get a string of right. a string of answers correct. Um, if you get a string of answers correct, whatever idea you had in mind uh, when you got that string of answers correct, you gain high confidence. And the reason why that's problematic is uh, you don't keep sampling. I was like, if we give you the option of like moving on to something else you do, you leave the task. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, you don't uh, actually figure out uh, what Daxi means. Uh, if we uh, create a circumstance in which you like keep collecting evidence, you don't weight it the same as you did before you were certain. So mm -hmm. uh, we think that um, this is a, a part of the puzzle in understanding how people sometimes have very stubborn beliefs that aren't justified given evidence in the world. Mm -hmm. You start with some idea. If you uh, get a few pieces of feedback that uh, are consistent with that, you may develop a high degree of certainty. And once you've done that, it may be hard to go back and revise. Right. This right. links in with like reason number two, why yeah. do we do this kind yeah. of research? Uh, uh, this may be was less common when you were walking around the world sampling from, I don't, I hesitate to use the term natural environment, but um, uh, an environment that's not optimized to what you want. Uh, like I'll call right. it that. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, now if you're going online to form your beliefs, <laughs> if you have some kind of idea and you watch some YouTube video, maybe you think like maybe the earth is flat, let me search for that. Uh, you get a few videos that are consistent with that. The risk is that you could develop a high degree of confidence that that's correct. And once you develop a high degree of confidence, you feel very, very certain. Um, your curiosity, your interest in revising plummets and you may get stuck with that wrong belief. Do you think that these kind of models for belief formation are inherent and therefore kind of unchangeable? Or can we possibly as humans adapt to these new environments that we're in that are kind of optimizing around our attention and priors? That is an excellent question that I would like to know the answer to. I was like, my whole life, I'd love, love to know the answer to. Um, uh, this actually, uh, so this is a question that uh, one of the lab members led one of the people that's now in the lab working on this stuff to, to the lab. Uh, uh, one of the people in the lab that's a research scientist is someone named Adam Conover, who mm -hmm. is predominantly, his background is in science communication and okay. also comedy. <laughs> and um, uh, he was very interested in how people might have a shot at uh, not forming bad beliefs online. Uh, an idea that we plan to test but are still working out right now mm -hmm. is whether or not uh, these tendencies people have may be able to be mitigated if they're aware of human belief formation processes or maybe right. alternatively if they're aware that the systems that are giving them information aren't the same as the, the natural world outside. Uh, yeah. I, I have extended family members that do not understand uh, that when they go on Facebook, this is not a true representative sample of opinions in the world. I was like, they, you know, we might think uh, they should know that. I was like, they should know um, that they're only seeing content from uh, people that they opted into seeing. They, they don't understand the algorithms that back the system. Yeah. They don't understand that what they hang on longer um, influences what they're more likely to see next. Uh, so instead, uh, they're drawing inferences under an incorrect assumption, which right. is that what they see represents what's true in the world. That's how our systems are made. Um, it's possible that understanding either something about your internal system, you could maybe make those bad tendencies <laughs> like to form yeah. beliefs that are not justified. Uh, maybe you could help mitigate some of those. Um, it's, also, it's also possible that knowing something about the backend system, you could adjust uh, but we really don't know. Uh, yeah. that, there's, there's a I'm little envisioning bit. like a, a routine or an experiment that uses the results of surprisal to kind of train people to shift their internal belief distribution or something like that. Right. Yes. People are sensitive to uh, 
they're capable of comprehending information about distributions and drawing correct inferences under different assumptions like replace versus not. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, the fact that we as scientists are capable of learning statistics, it's obviously possible. Mm -hmm. Um, How much of a difference it could make in these day-to-day, moment-to-moment decisions, you're forming beliefs constantly. Yeah. Um, so uh, is yet to be is yet to be seen. But there's some precedent from the implicit bias literature. If you are trying to make people less racist, the worst thing that they can do is say like, "I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I don't see color." I was like, "I'm not considering it." If you point out to people that they may have implicit biases, they're not conscious, but they're influencing their decision-making processes. It doesn't undo the biases, but they're they're lessened uh, just through that knowledge. So mm-hmm. it's possible that people knowing something about how they work and how they form beliefs could make a difference, but mm. we don't know. All right. So we were on number three. Uh, oh, number yeah. Number four. Uh, I talked about the influence of feedback and feedback being the primary driver of how certain you feel mm-hmm. and why this is problematic for uh, forming beliefs everywhere, but especially on the internet. Point number four is that in the absence of feedback, maybe you think like, if the feedback's problematic, we'll just remove it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's probably not right either. Uh, In the absence of feedback, people seem to be overconfident. And our evidence for that uh, is we look at situations in which people don't get very much feedback. We wanted to do something naturalistic and more kind of real worldly. Uh, this is work that was led by Louis Marti that was published in, in Open Mind very recently. Uh, the domain we came up with is uh, when two people use a word, are they activating this the same concept? So this is right. relating to the, the concept stuff that I talked about. Um, I talked about how uh, the first set of findings is about how... Um, when two people use a word, they have different concepts in mind. So it's like two people don't uh, uh, usually have the same concept in mind for abstract political kinds of concept like Joe Biden, um, but uh, they also don't have the same kind of concept for table either. I was like, we, we, were yeah. not ex- we were expecting to find like more disagreement about abstract things uh, like, you know, people in politics and, and uh, uh, less disagreement about concrete objects because you can observe them, but even for things like table and chair, those things also mean different things to different people. Hmm. So, uh, so many questions that I'm not going to ask due to lack of time. (laughs) Oh, you can. You can. You want to hear about something else. Um, We we were interested in this. uh, So so it it looks like uh, people have, there's more than one concept in the population. I was like, we, we tried to, uh, we use tools from ecology and um, uh, various, various clustering techniques for uh, trying to infer the true distribution of clusters of beliefs in the population. And when you do that, you get something like five to 10 uh, for, for, for most concepts, although they're not all the same. It's like there's more disagreement about- What are examples of the five to 10 beliefs people have about tables? Um, well, so the, the data from this, I guess, uh, the, you know, the question that I wanted to ask penguins. that I said that I yeah. wouldn't yeah. was, ask it. you know, how, how do we know that it's not just differences in the way we describe things as opposed to the fundamental inherent belief about this thing? Because we control the context. Actually, I don't know if that, I started saying that and then I'm not sure if that's actually the answer to your question. Mm. Um, uh, we get this data. We didn't want people, we, so first of all, like we don't ask about uh, words that have synonyms because it could be that it looks like two different concepts, but people, mm-hmm. that's like a different weird situation. Um, we're asking about things like penguins uh, or people in politics uh, or concrete objects um, or uh, or abstract concepts depending upon uh, the, 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 the particular experiment. Um, uh, we're controlling the context to minimize the chance that when people appear to have two different concepts, it's because they're imagining a different situation. It's like, Mm -hmm. uh, instead we're getting this data from like, here's Donald Trump, who is he more similar to? And you just pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. So we're fitting the data to, to binary vectors. And we're thinking Um, about like the concrete example, like a table, you know, I might describe it functionally as the thing that you put things on. I mm -hmm. might describe it structurally. It's a thing that has legs. That variation I would say falls under the context in which you're thinking of a table and we're controlling for that by saying just pick 
is a table more similar to a glass ah, okay. or to a tape recorder. Um, so we're getting around that by um, just having you make a judgment Got with it. respect to the other objects to control for exactly, well, that problem and then also the like people imagining a different situation. Yeah, okay. uh, we wouldn't want to conclude that people have two different concepts of table because somebody is picturing a table that's like sitting there and somebody else is picturing a table that like someone is standing on so it's more like a stage right. um, or something like that. So okay. uh, we control the context by just having you judge how similar a table is to like a glass. And then hopefully everybody has. <laughs> it's like pretty much um, uh, the same concept in mind. Um, I should also maybe add that for this work, in the past, most people have thought about concepts like table as being relatively stable. Uh, it's less important exactly how many concepts there are and more important that there's not one. <laughs> like So right. the way people usually think about these things is just one. Um, instead, uh, your concept of table is slightly changed by every table you encounter in your life. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that uh, what you'd accept as a table as opposed to uh, a stage, maybe table is a weird example Unless you're going to make a distinction between like a coffee table and like a dining table, right, uh, cup like and bowl a is high top. Right, yeah, cup cup and bowl is a is a is a classic is a classic okay. example. Uh, I mean, I'm imagining many conversations I've had with my wife who grew yeah. up in a different area refers to things slightly differently, and you know exactly. we have these circular conversations. Oh, that's not a X Y Z. That's yeah. a you know A B C. Like, no, it's a X Y Z. Yes, yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. The, the, the 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 there were some classic studies. Uh, in psychology that thought of like cups and bowls as happening on a continuum. So I was mm -hmm. like, what counts as a cup and what counts as a bowl maybe depends partially on the material, but then also like the width versus the height, but or, also like the absolute size. Uh, or if all the cups are dirty, then <laughs> my daughter was known to have drunk out of a bowl. <laughs> correct, correct. And I was like, now it's a bowl. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, all, the, all the bowls are dirty. Now this, now this cup is a bowl. And um, uh, yeah, I've, also, I've also pulled that one. Um, uh, with with small children, uh, so um, yeah, so so the the uh, where you draw the line, you might expect people had pretty similar places, uh, but it looks like it's it's more different than you might expect, mm -hmm. uh, even for the concrete objects. So okay. um, where I would draw the line at the cup bowl distinction, depending on the relationship of absolute size and height and width, um, uh -huh. is probably different uh, from uh, some substantial portion of the population, and where people draw the line. Along all of these dimensions, that you you can you can cluster them together and try to come up with an estimate for roughly um, okay. how many how many overall concepts there are. Okay. Uh, so yeah, big point is there's not one. <laughs> like right, for right, right, right. Um, uh, <laughs> even things like penguin and cup and bowl. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the question we were most interested in asking is, given that there is variation when two people use one word, uh, they're not necessarily activating the same concept. Are people aware? of that possibility. As like, mm. do I know when I say something, you may not have the same thing in mind? Uh, and the answer- it Goes back to points two, three. And, right. right. <laughs> uh, the answer the answer is no. Right. <laughs> it's like, right. um, there's a really fun like sub finding, which is uh, people generally overestimate the degree to which they believe that their concept will align with somebody else's. But if you have a weirdo deviant definition of something, if you're activating a concept that's like very different from other people in the population, you actually have a better chance at being aware of that, mm -hmm. uh, which is not what I would have guessed. If you talk mm. to somebody that's like using words weirdly, <laughs> it's like you might expect it's because they uh, are unaware of that deviant usage. I was like, they're more likely to be aware that mm. that is a weird way of that's a weird concept that they have. Uh, so is it, all this related to the, I forget the name of the law, like people who, you know, experts perceive their oh, level Kruger of expertise. Effect. Yeah, Dunning-Kruger. Yeah, it, it's possible. There's definitely a connection to uh, this. Is, so the Dunning-Kruger Kruger effect is if you are very competent, you're more likely to be aware of the areas in which you have incompetence. But if you're totally clueless, you are not aware of all the ways right. you're, so as, <laughs> the, the, if you're estimating your own competence uh, it doesn't it doesn't go well given given those dynamics um, mm -hmm. that's so I, I don't know it's not exactly the same thing but that is an interesting point uh, you might think that it's a bad design if people their estimates of their own incompetence are not well matched to how incompetent they actually are. Mm -hmm. But Shirlene, Shirlene Wade's research uh, from my lab showing that uh, people are most curious 
when they believe that they're about to know the answer, when they believe that they're about to know everything, hmm. uh, those two things taken together might actually indicate that that's a, a feature, not, not a bug. Okay. Uh, if you, at the beginning of learning something new, were acutely aware of how incompetent you were. <laughs> I was like, what our data from the lab would say is that you would not be motivated to take that first step. Right. You may never try to approach it. It actually may be a good thing mm. from a motivational standpoint that when you first start out learning something new, you don't know. <laughs> I was like, how Blissfully much you don't ignorant. know? Right. Yeah, I was like, to have your incompetence revealed incrementally, we would predict is the gives you the best chance of, of continuing yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. And so very quickly, that, that fifth point. And that fifth point, uh, people form beliefs very quickly. So uh, it's possible for people to go from completely undecided to uh, believing that they should buy the like weird black smoothie bagel, those things that are mm -hmm. in the like expensive coffee shops that have charcoal added to them uh, for I, unclear, unclear um, uh, pseudoscientific wellness purposes. It doesn't take very long <laughs> or, or to form the belief. To form that belief mm -hmm. with high confidence. And uh, so when we're we're designing systems that offer information to people, it's really important that we keep that in mind. When somebody's certain, they stop searching. When they see disconfirming evidence after that point, it doesn't count for the same. Mm. Uh, so uh, I I think the takeaway of all of this, uh, the big point that I wanted to make in the talk was that. Uh, when you hear people say that this tool or this platform is neutral, that's, I would say, dishonest. Uh, we know that there are ways of making decisions behind the scenes that influence people's behavior. As like all of us design things that change behavior as like whether or not you're making different decisions about how to present uh, different options of, of suggested items that people might purchase or uh, whether you are uh, trying to keep people on your, your, your site for longer. If people's behavior is changing as a function of different design decisions you make or different types of things that you optimize, uh, it's important to remember that the mediating variable there is human beliefs. You're messing with human beliefs mm. and um, you're messing with what people know and they walk away into the real world to make real world decisions mm -hmm. with those changed beliefs. So uh, th th there is no neutral platform. I think that's a really ill-conceived way of thinking about these problems. I think it's irresponsible. It's mm -hmm. really important to... Uh, appreciate that the way you present information, the order in which you present information, right. it really matters and it has That's profound a really impacts. really important result. Like I yeah. think we tend to think about, you know, the kind of influences you're describing is just influencing discrete behaviors or actions right. as opposed to fundamentally beliefs. Right. And they're very different. And you can't... One is transient, one is... Yeah, you can't change behavior without altering people's beliefs. And uh, mm -hmm. it's important to keep that in mind and to uh, treat that duty with the respect it, it deserves. Right. Really interesting stuff. We could go on for another hour, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> well, Celeste, thanks so much for you know taking some time out of your busy neurops to come chat with us and share a bit about what you're up to. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. For more information on today's guest or our NeurIPS podcast series, head over to twimmelai.com slash NeurIPS 2019. Thanks once again to Shell for sponsoring this week's series. Check out the Shell.ai residency program by typing Shell.ai into your browser's address bar. Thanks so much for listening. Happy holidays and catch you next time.